Hey everyone, welcome to part one of a two-part series where I explain the return of the Oberdin in chronological order. Make sure you support Lucas Pope by purchasing a copy of the game, and make sure you hit that subscribe button for part two and more of my content to support the channel. Abigail, your brother, my friend, I shot him dead. I'll be with you soon, my love. Please forgive me for everything. Before we get into the full swing of things, I just wanted to let you know if you ever want to play through the story chronologically yourself, all you have to do is use the stopwatch. If you look at the stopwatch right now, we're looking at chapter 2, part 1. If we go to this corpse, we're looking at chapter 6, part 5. And if we go over to the corpse over here, which is Emilio, we'll see that his fate was met in chapter 6, part 6. So you can use that kind of as a guide. So just to preface what we're about to go through, I'm going to start from chapter 1, part 1, and go through to chapter 10, part 4. The difficulty in playing through the game in chronological order and trying to follow it in-game is a lot of people are not going to be able to be identified at the time that I'm identifying them, which means the best way to get a good picture of everything that's happening in the story is just to proceed in the game until you get to the very end and then backtrack. Let's get started. So starting things off quickly, we have our first casualty of the trip, Chapter 1, Part 1. This is the fate of Seaman Samuel Peters, brother of Seaman Nathan Peters. If we look up we can see Lars Lind looking down. Later on, you'll see that he is the reason why he is confused as the murderer of Samuel Peters. And as we look up, we see three members who I believe to be Volkov, O'Hagan, and Nathan Peters. Everyone else should be on the bottom two decks. <laughs> An interesting scene, if not just a scene meant to confuse you. Uh, this is a stowaway that's on the ship. Technically, he's probably the 61st member of the Oberdin, but because we don't have to identify him, we don't have to pay out his insurance claim. <laughs> Bitter Cold Part 1 starts with the death of Solomon Sayed, as identified by William Wasim, 
He identifies them in the dialogue, which is pretty straightforward. The misleading notion about this part is that it is so early in the game, most players aren't ready for the level of complexity that is being asked of them and will often miss key personnel characteristics. In part one, you're expected to go around and analyze the crew members. The easiest hints players would be able to find are William Wasim can be identified due to his hammock being empty and his hammock number being shown. Renfred Ranju can be identified by his hammock number and his face, which is clearly shown. Another key piece of information that doesn't necessarily lead to a complete identification is the dialogue of the corresponding Russians playing cards. This allows you to group them together by nationality so that you have a face to go with the person. What most players will often miss when they go through this part of the game is Toporov's bag and pipe are hanging from his hammock. This is the key item to identify Toporov later on as well. Timothy Butman's tattoo is clearly shown as his arm is hanging out while he sleeps. If you go over to the Asian top men, this is where you would look at the socks and shoes of the Asian top men to identify which one is which with the corresponding bunk number. A less obvious hint that ties into a later part of the game is George Shirley's number. Seen with the Asian top men, you won't be able to place George Shirley to the top men until later on in the game when he's seen playing cards with them. Same as the other fellow. Some lung disease, not a consumption. <coughs> Made worse by the cold. Will it spread? If so, we'd all have it. They must have picked it up at the Alaska house. I checked all hands just now, and everyone is healthy. And him? <coughs> what are his chances? I gave him some laudanum. We'll see. <coughs> In this scene, we have figured out that Renfred Radjub has suffered a similar fate to Syed, but Surgeon Henry Evans assures the rest of the crew is safe, ironically. In this part, we can identify Surgeon Henry Evans rather easily. You can kind of tell from his attire, as well as his vicinity to Radjub, not to mention he's doing doctorly duties. At this point, you're able to deduce as well the surgeon's mate sitting quite casually in his chair, Further scenes will actually reflect his medical duties better than this scene, so don't feel too bad if you don't get it in this scene. Outside of the room, you can see that the crew is attending to Syed's body. Let's her here. One swing. Get through the skull in stone or brain. I'll cut her throat when you've done it. Here? Yeah. Come on before she kicks up. <laughs> you all right there, sir? Well, never been on a farm, Chuck. Mind your shoes now. In this scene, I felt Emil O'Farrell's identity is easily deduced, mostly based on his age, but also because of his mannerisms, being a butcher. In this scene, we're also introduced to the midshipmen, although at this point, only Charles Hirschtick, or Charlie as they call him, can be identified as he quickly de-chugs. This is the first part of the game where the Formosan royalty can be seen, but quite honestly, it's a bit early for that. At the stairs, you can see Rajub's body is being attended to by the crewmates, overseen by the surgeon. The only death in this scene is that one poor, delicious cow. Hello? Who is there? Who is that? Is someone hurt? Senor Nichols, is that you? What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, yes. All fine here. Just uh, sorting some things. Watch what, your step. Here, let me help you. We can see that second mate, Senore Nichols, 
aka the foreshadowed cowardly and most backstabbiest maid of all, is clearly responsible for the stabbing of Nunzio Pasqua. The identity of Nunzio can be done by his mediocre Italian accent, and I guess the use of the word Signore, this might be reading into it too much, but if you look at the picture of Nunzio, he has a violin, which kind of plays into the music that goes on in this scene. I don't know if it's related, but couldn't help but mentioning. The build-up to this chapter revolves around the passenger's cargo, where you can see Hawk Sing Lao is currently unconscious on the floor, and the plot driving magic conch shell is in sight in the chest. Hock Seng Lao, you have been found guilty by self-confession of the murder of Nunzio Pasqua. Quiet. As captain of this ship, and by the authority of the East India Company, and thus the Crown of England, I sentence you to death by firing line. <laughs> Mr. Wolf, when you are ready. Right, sir. Ready, men. Aim. Fire! Here, in Hock Seng Lao's execution, is a perfect example of a very detailed-oriented scene in order to deduce who murders Hawks and Lao. Starting with the obvious, Captain Witterell is judge and juror of the so-called self-confession and instructs Christian Wolf by name to conduct the firing squad composed of O'Hagan, Naples, Toporov, and Brennan. Of importance, there is no died by execution you need to follow the bullet streams in order to see that Brennan was the true marksman and cause of Hock Sing Lao's death. Moving away from the obvious, if you look around a ship, this is the first time that you will see, for the most part, the crew members congregating with their respective seniors or performing their duties. You'll see the ship's mates accompanied by their stewards. The midshipmen are supposed to be together, but strangely they're nowhere to be found on deck. The butcher and cook are together. The top men are doing their top of the ship duty, but also being just high enough that you can see their shoes and socks. The Formosans, of course, are being repressed. And in relation to the sketch, Justice at Sea, we can identify Edward Spratt as he is currently situated at an angle that would capture the scene. Slack the lifts and lower the boats! The whole crew will be on us! Give it up! We end off the chapter with the death of top man Timothy Butman. We identified Timothy Butman by his obvious tattoo uh, and his bunk number that we took from A Bitter Cold. Funny enough, when I went through this chapter the first time, I didn't realize that Timothy Butman wasn't acting alone. Finley Dalton, the helmsman, was also injured. Uh, Lars Lind appeared to be hit. And Peter Milroy fell or something. On the left we see O'Hagan, and on the right we see Nichols without his hat. With Nichols, we can also see that his steward came along with him. This is also finally the scene that you can identify Toporov as he's carrying his bag and pipe. Of special note, and kind of conspiracy-like, we can see that Li Hong is accompanying the party. He would have been the one to have translated the confession, so it's kind of thought that he was in on the whole thing. Nevertheless, it being Sia and Bunlan Lim are taken hostage. Keep course due east. You'll reach the Canaries in three days. You've packed enough stores? Aye, sir. Checked and loaded them myself. Good. Stay quiet and alert. If the wind picks up, we've no chance against the Oberdin. Shoot ya! The one trouble! Top Man Li Hong is the first of the mutinous crew to meet their fate in the calling. Li Hong can be identified by his white socks and his peculiar shoes that you would have been able to see in the bitter coal. 
In the dialogue, we can see that Bunlan Lim is identified as Miss Lim. Just as a bit of extra information, this is actually only in the English translation as far as I can tell. The dialogue itself only recognizes her as Miss in Ming Nan. Anyone familiar with a Chinese dialects such as Mandarin would realize that this text says Xiao Jie, which is Miss. While there's still some minor details you can get from this, such as Toporov's pipe identifying Toporov, the whole scene is being set up by the ominous notion that the chest should not fall into the ocean. The Formosans mentioning that the shell should not fall into the ocean is kind of weird, but at this point we'll leave it until a further chapter to discuss. Part 2 reveals the death of Patrick O'Hagan. O'Hagan isn't identified in this part, rather in part 3 when the second maid Stuart calls out to see if he's still breathing, which is tough when you see he has a spike in his neck. The only identity that I would say is fully revealed in this part is it being Sia when Miss Lim calls out to her uncle, but of course, the English subtitles don't want you to have very tough of a time identifying him in this game, so they kind of lay it out for you. Of note, on Ipping Sia's boat, you can see on the floor there's the knife that he will use to attack the steward in part 3. This is also the chapter that introduces character absences from further in the trip. These are characters that are not given screens focusing on their deaths or disappearances, and it's up to you to pay attention during the scene to kind of spot where people go missing. One of these absences is Alarkish Nikishkin, who is pulled overboard by a mermaid. You're still breathing? Can you roll? <laughs> Nichols, sir, shoot them for God's sake! Here we can see it being Sia following through on Samuel Galgan. Galgan can be inferred as the second mate steward in the murder part 2 in Hock Seng Lao's execution, as he is quite in close proximity to Nichols. You can also tell from his attire that he's a steward. But to be quite honest, I'll blame the cutting edge graphics for not identifying the stewards matching uniforms in my first playthrough. I'm also losing track of the number of times and instances second mate Nichols is being identified, but this is probably the first scene that you can see Nichols cowering like the pansy he is in his boat. Here's also the second disappearance of the chapter. You can see Toporov being pulled into the ocean with his trusty pipe flying away with him. I found it odd that Galgan was the focus of the scene when clearly Bun Lan Lim has her throat clawed open by a mermaid with a seashell. She gets her own scene, but trust me, this much better represents the moment of passing. The only other notable action in the scene is Itbin Sia going for the chest, almost as if he knows what he's doing. Like I said, this isn't the best scene that depicts Bun Lan Lim's death, but it is the kind of sombering one that Lucas Pope would want you to have. But obviously, in the grand scheme of things here, we look over and we see It Bin Sia has taken the shell from the drawer and dipped it into the liquid quicksilver, which, for whatever reason, starts the laser light show and attacks the mermaids. I don't know how it happens, I don't know what's happening, all I can tell you is not a single person on the Oberdin is able to replicate this amount of success with the shells, and it becomes downright embarrassing. I'm going to give the English translation team a solid C- on this, having added more words than simply miss, miss, 
It being Sia obviously stuck his hand in magical liquid metal, which is why his hand is still on fire. And of course, we can see second mate Nichols pulling a mermaid onto the boat so that he can bring it back to the ship, well knowing that he can't make it to shore with the treasure anymore. Opposite of Nichols' boat, we see a mermaid pulled into the other lifeboat. It just so happens that the other magic shell is in that boat, still attached to the mermaid. Wait! Don't shoot! I have treasure! I yield! Hold your fire! <laughs> oh wait, I have treasure, don't shoot. Oh, what's that? Those corpses? The corpses of the family that you were trying to protect and I took out onto the boat as hostage? Oh, don't worry about that. They're fine. So obviously, we end the calling with two easy points. One being the obvious death by shooting of second mate Nichols as well as the identity of Chiho Tan by really process of elimination. He's the only Formosan left. The fourth mate can be identified by process of elimination as well, if you were really attentive enough. However, if you were like me and kind of struggled through your first playthrough when the uh, captain's mates had their hats removed and they all looked the same, uh, the less easier but far more conclusive way of figuring out John Davies' identity is his location on the ship when the boats arrive. If you look, you can see his on the second level of the ship. The point that really progresses the plot here is that the magical light from it being Sia's actions merely just stunned the mermaids, and having multiple shells and live mermaids on the boat, it'll turn out to be quite disastrous. What the hell is going on? What do you know about these things? About the chest and your dead friends? Very Shell? What shell? Chi Ho Tan didn't really get to bask in sweet vengeance as he divulges more mystery surrounding the shell. Weird part is, is he doesn't say how the shell is dangerous, just that it's vaguely dangerous enough to kill everyone on board. You can see that Hamadou Diom is killed as well in the scene. Diom deserves two extra difficulty stars on his rank because you will really end up narrowing it down between two really tough identities in this game, because literally, at the end of the game, most people will find that they have Dion and Alexander Booth left because they don't do anything significant enough to be recognized. The way that you're supposed to identify Dion is because you can identify Booth better. Booth, in his limited speaking roles, has an English accent. As well, Booth has a hammock still hung up in the Doom chapter, which means Dion never made it past this chapter. The scene is mostly just a plot pusher, so nothing can really be attained from this part, aside from maybe the captain being in the dark about the Formosan's cargo. A solid meal, boys. <laughs> Never know. Take it slow. One sec, gentlemen. There's a free shell here. Let's have a look. No, get back. This is another short bridging scene. Uh, here we identify the cook, Thomas Sefton, who really stands himself out as the cook by saying cook words and his matching cook accessory. Weirdly, he is completely oblivious why two people died on the deck and proceeds to talk about the shiny shell around the mermaid and then gets tail slapped. On the main deck, some crew are still attending to Tan and Dion, but there's a very important second plot point here as Philip Dahl, who has been present since Chiho Tan shot Nichols after hearing about their foreboding doom, mysteriously runs off. Wow. 
Following the deadly slap, William Wasim, who we identified in a bitter cold, heard the unidentified crewman saying look out, and of course, attempted to cushion the net's fall with his neck. This heroic action of attempting to save the company property from damage was glorified by the East Indian Trade Company, and his entire estate was rewarded 25 pounds, which is probably just the price of a replacement net. But really, the important part of the scene is the hints towards the identity of Winston and Marcus, the ship's carpenter and carpenter's mate, who checks on the commotion from the carpenter's quarters. One will identify the other in a later chapter. Keep pressure here. Hold him down. What madness is this? Twenty years, my steward, had never a doubt on your sanity. Explain yourself. Those ungodly beasts carry a curse. Throw them back or doom us all. Tie him up and put him in the lazarette with those things. He may yet find his senses. Come on. All's fine, John. Been in worse spots, I think. Where's the rest of his leg? So, we finally caught up with Philip Dahl, who decided to go mental on John Naples and apparently had enough time to cut off his leg. Philip Dahl is identified by the captain, calling him his steward. And John Naples is identified by the surgeon, of course, reinforcing his surgeon identity, by reassuring John and by calling him John. And seeing how he is the only other John on the ship without a hat, he is clearly not the fourth mate. In this scene, the bosun can technically be identified as he is coming out of the bosun's storage with rope. The bosun's mate is less identifiable in this scene, as he can be seen hauling off Philip Dahl to the lazarette for, you know, two chapters but we have a different way of identifying him later. Everyone else is on aftermath cleaning duty. That will conclude the first part of the Return of the Oberdin. For those of you who stuck through to the end, thank you for your support and bearing through my editing schedule. Please stay tuned for part two and more True Slider content.